experience in the field of geophysical ground surveying and satellite monitoring include interferometrics, synthetic aperture radar, INSA, for ground and infrastructure instability monitoring and additional satellite monitoring solution for environmental applications. So uh, we will open the question to the floor at the end of the of Mr. Alastar's speech. So, but however, if you can see on your right side of your chat box, if you have any question, you can always put it there first. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, so uh, Mr. Alessa, you can hear me? Can you can you hear me? Yes, loud and clear. All right. So uh, the floor is yours, Mr. Alessa. Thank you, thank you. Yeah, and uh, good afternoon to everybody. Um, you can see my screen, can you? Yes, we can. Yeah. Okay. All right. Okay. So thank you, Mr. Tree, for the uh, introduction. It's very, very nice to be here. Thank you for the invite to come and uh, discuss satellite INSA uh, with IEM. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, as uh, Mr. Tree has alluded to, I'm going to be talking about satellite INSA for monitoring the stability or instability of infrastructure and ground movement in terms of settlement through time. Um, so for those who are not at all familiar with um, satellite INSAR, um, it's a uh, system which uses satellite-borne radar data to monitor very accurate displacements on the ground. Um, it's not a real-time system and it's not in competition with ground instrumentation. Um, what I'm going to do today is go through some basics about how INSAR works. Um, so that we get a basic understanding about how we capture the data, um, when we process it, um, what kind of processes we go through, what kind of deliverables are given at the end, and then how do those deliverables match up to uh, your expectations in terms of monitoring ground movement. Um, I've been asked also to go through a few technical considerations. Um, by this, I mean the satellite itself is not looking in exactly the same direction as you might be used to with, with ground instrumentation. Um, so in order to really take benefit from inside data, uh, one needs to understand which angle we're looking at the, uh, the ground from and what real displacement we're monitoring. Um, and that fits in nicely also with the integration with in situ measurements, which you're most likely very familiar with. Um, and then once we're familiar with the maps and the deliverables that we offer, I'm going to show some geotechnical applications um, for civil engineering and indeed slope uh, monitoring. So from our point of view as a INSAR provider and as an any INSAR uh, company, we are just an instrumentation company. So we provide data sets that have been processed through our commercial algorithms. As Mr. Tree said, I do work for an INSAR company, but this is not um, a commercial discussion. The images that you will see obviously pertain to an INSAR company, but the goal here is to talk about the technology and how it can be applied um, to the different um, projects that you might um, be uh, be running. And I've broken down uh, the applications into these three macro sessions, but really um, it can be broken down even, even further into more detailed areas, um, and really every single project is different. So um, in terms of uh, the three categories I've put here, pre-construction baseline. So what was moving before we started changing the ground? Was there any natural phenomena that we didn't see from our pre-construction baseline survey? Um, what was the direct impact of the active construction um, on the ground immediately above or beside where we're working and indeed the wider area? Um, and then once we've built our project, whether we've built a building, we've, we've dug a tunnel, uh, we've constructed some, uh, some uh, a, a seawall or some reconsolidated uh, ground, um, is that performing in the way that we expect? We can verify that using a satellite over very wide areas and the long-term assessment of the asset itself, for example, a road. Um, are we seeing displacements that we don't expect? Um, and then what a typical insight would a company would offer in terms of how that how they would structure a project so at the end of that hopefully um i've passed a clear message on 
insight on how it can be applied, whether you're already considering it, whether you're already using it, or whether you um, haven't ever heard of insight before. Um, hopefully you get a clear understanding of how it works and how it can be applied for projects. So um, I come back to my original point, insight really is not a real-time instru instrument. If you need real-time real real -time instrumentation, uh, then you must use obviously a real-time in situ instrument. Uh, insight is a, is a technology that can see very wide areas and very comparatively accurate um, time series of displacement over wide areas, um, which will show a slightly different area in movement compared to in-situ uh, measurements. And I just want to show the comparison between uh, what in-situ instruments would give and then what insight would give so that you can see the benefits of both approaches. I, I think I'll probably go through about um, 60 or 70 slides here and then uh, we'll leave, uh, after about an hour and a half, we'll leave time for a, a nice number of questions. Um, so insight, what is insight and what does it mean? Well. The acronym INSAR is really the name of a family of processing chains. Um, and this will depend, of course, on which satellite uh, or INSAR provider uh, you choose at the end. But really, INSAR means Interferometric Synthetic Aperture Radar. So what, the, what this means, it broken down clearly radar. We're familiar with radar. We've seen it on uh, police guns and we've seen it in, uh, for example, ground radar and um, stations that can uh, detect where airplanes are or maybe slopes that are moving in mining sites. What it means is that we've got a sensor on board a satellite um, and the satellite is actively emitting a radar signal from the satellite down to the ground and then that radar signal is bouncing off of the ground and being reflected back up to the satellite so we're capturing an image every time the satellite passes over this area and then an insight company would take that data which can come from multiple different satellites we process it and then we come up with this map of displacement through time. The synthetic aperture part means that we effectively simulate a stationary satellite over a project site. For example, you're building a new metro station. Um, for you, the data looks like the satellite has always been above your metro station, but of course it's not. It's moving continuously um, around the Earth on what we call a near polar orbit, so normally north, south to, north to south pole orbit. An interferometric is the uh, part where we acquire an image today, satellite passes around the Earth, the Earth rotates, a few days later, the satellite comes back, takes another image, satellite passes, takes another image, so on and so forth for several months, and then we process the data. We process the data and then we come up with this time map that shows what's moved, where and when, over the period that we process. So the interferometric means through time, so in this case, uh, an interferogram is one image plus another image. So there's two images put together. Take a stack of data acquired over a long period of time, just like you would do with a leveling survey, a benchmark, take one this week, next week, the week after, and then you see a time series of movement of displacement through time. The same is also true for the interferometric approach. Um, and we provide also a time series of movement from the original point. So the map that you obtain on the ground as you can probably see from this image, is very wide area. So it's a remote sensing technology. We don't put anything on the ground normally. 99% of the cases, there's nothing on the ground and everything is reflecting back from an object on the ground, which can be um, a lamppost, it can be a building, it can be a road, it can be an open outcrop. Um, it's not always possible to know exactly what is reflecting on the ground, which is a very interesting point because when you place a leveling benchmark, you know exactly where the leveling benchmark is. Whereas with an, with an INSAR approach, you wouldn't necessarily know exactly what has reflected. You will know where the measurement point is, and we provide information on where that point is in X, Y, and Z with their respective accuracies. Um, and you can compare that then with in situ uh, measurements. However, it will be the nearest point to where we find a measurement point. And we can't force the system to um, provide a point in a particular area. The points are where the points fall. And the points fall where we have what we call reflectivity and coherence through time. So these are factors, and I will come onto this without going into too much detail in this very first slide. I'll come onto this later about what the limitations of, of, of INSAR are as well. Um, but as far as I'm concerned, as uh, Mr. Tree said, I have been now uh, across in the Far East for seven years and I've been working um, with INSAR for the last 17 years um, and 
INSAR is by no means a very new technology. So we're in the same position as GPS was really 50 years ago. Um, it was amazing that you could get very accurate displacements using satellites that were geostationary several hundred kilometers above the surface of the uh, of the Earth. And now the technology has come a long way. You look at your phone and you know exactly where you are on the map and you trust the data set. It says you're here, and so you say, okay, you know what, GPS is accurate. And GPS is accurate to one or two millimeters. INSAR is the same as well. Um, I see many times the question, how can you get a millimeter of displacement on the ground detected from a satellite that is 800 kilometers above the surface? Um, if there are concerns about the accuracy of the, of, of the system, there are plenty of publications um, by independent uh, uh, independent public, uh, publications or journals that have taken in-situ data and compared them together. I will show some slides on this a bit further down the line, um, but it, it's not a new technology. Um, perhaps in Malaysia, I would admit that um, for who I represent, we have had several projects in Malaysia, but nowhere near to the same extent as we have in Europe. But the technology has been around since um, the year 2000. Um, so really, we're going strong at 24 years. But and it really has become for a number of uh, monitoring approaches an integrated monitoring approach. So again, like I said at the beginning, INSAR, we're not aiming to be the number one technology that replaces other technologies. That's not the case. INSAR has certain advantages and INSAR has disadvantages compared to um, in situ instruments. So it really is an integrated approach to get a very clear, a much clearer picture about what's happening on the ground. The goal of INSAR here is to provide a safety critical in data set to assess the stability and works related instabilities, so directly related to what ground changes occur th throughout the construction of a project, allowing for the remote and long term monitoring of site wide displacements before they become critical. So we could call INSAR um, uh, in two ways here, really. One is an early warning detection system that says, OK, I'm seeing several millimeters of uh, uh, of movement per year. And then I start to see an acceleration, perhaps in an area where you don't have in situ monitoring. Or the other way, it could be a check on the in situ instrumentation that you've got in place. Um, in terms of civil engineering, I mean, this this discussion here today is uh, is principally for civil engineering and also uh, given that Malaysia has many, many slopes still related to civil engineering um, challenges, I'll focus on those. But really, as an instrumentation company, wherever we apply our instrument, we're providing a map of ground displacement through the period of time that we process the satellite data. So if I start today and I go back six months in time because I've got a historical archive over, for example, Kuala Lumpur, um, I could go back in time and say how the ground has moved in the last six months. And the application could be, um, for a bridge or it could be for a tunnel or it could be for just general ground sediment it could be for groundwater um move movement related to groundwater um, extraction or injection um it's true there aren't too many mines um in the center of kuala lumpur or oil and gas stations but um as a range of applications insar can be applied to many different applications the two most pertinent perhaps for malaysia are indeed the civil engineering markets um, and natural hazards. So here I talk about not necessarily flooding, but slope stability. So there are um, obviously unstable slopes um, in Malaysia, um, some of which have failed recently as well. And the application there would be to identify as early as possible any change in behavior in the slope before it fails. If there is an instantaneous failure on a slope, INSAR is not your tool for sure, because we're not real time, like I mentioned before. But a combination of INSAR, for example, long term monitoring, regular updates on the slope, it's moving, moving, moving. I've got it. I've got it on my radar. I can see it. And then I start to see an acceleration. That's the point when you might want to consider placing in situ instrumentation. So it's a combination of these two technologies to get a very clear overview of what's moving on the ground and what's not. And then to help optimize um, in situ instrumentation as and when uh, required. So how does INSAR work? I mentioned we've got um, a satellite. There are multiple different satellites that can be used, um, most of which <laughs> are either run by space agencies or commercial satellite companies. The choice of satellite is actually normally depicted by the application. Um, so um, a reasonable INSAR company would turn around and suggest a satellite that's most appropriate for the application. And the application itself, if predominantly um, 
a civil engineering project would be either a medium, but in most cases, a high resolution satellite. Um, so the choice of satellite really comes down to the application, like I said, but what's important to note is this um, element here, it's called a line of sight or LOS, L-O-S. So although we're 800 kilometers above the earth, as it passes, over your project area, and it will do every few days, depending on the satellite, the frequency of acquisition will change. It takes a snapshot. We buy, as an inside company, we buy just the imagery that is pertinent to your project. Um, and then we process that data stack that has been acquired over several months or years. Um, the swath, we call it a swath, the amount of um, area that the satellite covers is dependent again on the satellite that we use. So high resolution will have a smaller swath range and a, a lower resolution will have a wider one, very similar to your, the older TVs. An older TV will have potentially larger pixels and therefore the amount of detail that you see is lower compared to the new 4K or what, what we, whatever we have now, 8K TV, very, very high density of pixels, very, very clear understanding of the picture of what's happening on the ground um, and indeed the smaller the pixel, the smaller the area and movement you can monitor. And that is a really critical um, statement. Again, it comes down to the application and the application will decide what the smallest size possible or ideal smallest size possible um, would be to monitor. And then that will decide the satellite. So should you choose an INSAR um, option, it would be an, a, a useful discussion. And I will go through the differences in the, in the resolutions to have with your INSAR provider to say, look, this is what I need on the ground. What can you feasibly give me from a satellite? So the line of sight is, means that we're actually acquiring not perfectly vertical. And there's a good reason for that, a good technical reason. And that is that as the signal comes down from the satellite, if it were vertical, the area that bounced off to the left and the right, both those areas would, those both those, those radar returns would, would go back to the satellite at exactly the same time. So the, the, the return that comes first is from the nearest area, which is the uh, area closest to the normal. And then the area that comes last is the one furthest away. So the line of sight is gives us an advantage from the technical point of view. And I will also discuss um, the secondary advantage of this, and that is when we want to obtain true vertical and true horizontal ground displacements, which I will come on to in a few slides. Um, you'll probably all be very familiar with the optical uh, imagery, which is uh, your very high resolution optical image, for example, that you see in Google Earth or on Bing Maps. Um, we're not using that. And the principal reason is these uh, clouds. <laughs> Excuse me. Optical imagery um, cannot penetrate through clouds, whereas radar does. So we call uh, INSAR, an all-weather system. It is true that INSAR is affected by humidity, atmospheric changes, uh, satellite wonder, um, the exact positioning of a satellite in space, for example. Um, and then, of course, ground conditions, for example, vegetation or water on the ground, snow, not very common in Malaysia, of course, but um, these are factors that do affect our ability to capture movement on the ground. But there are ways to remove those um, or estimate the error that's created from those and then remove those in the processing. And here, um, this will come down to each individual INSAR uh, company's uh, experience and capacity to estimate and then remove those, leaving just two objects in the uh, map. And that one is topography and the second is movement. So as long as you know the topography pretty well from a digital elevation model, um, we can then estimate two millimeter accuracy um, the displacement on the ground. So the reason why we use radar is because we can see through the clouds because you wouldn't be able to with the optical data. There are a number of satellites that we can use and I won't dwell too much on the specific satellite sensor here because like I said before, it really comes down to the project. But the most important point from this slide to note is that the data actually runs back to here, 1992. So when the first satellite it, uh, was, was launched by the European Space Agency, um, back in 1992, they then started acquiring imagery all over Europe and in some cases all around the world. Uh, and that data set made it possible for um, university departments normally to play with the data and then come up with this interferometric approach, um, which is comparing one image with another one to then create a map of displacement from two different time periods, two different very discrete time periods. 
Um, out of that was born in 2000, the Insight technology, and since then it's come forward in leaps and bounds in terms of accuracy and then the repeatability. But it's not only from the processing side of things that things have really improved, it's also been um, from a satellite point of view. And there are now multiple sensors with indeed new launches planned. Um, for example, NISAR, um, which will be launched as an L-band satellite in the, in the forthcoming years. All of these data sensors have archives of historical data, which means that over Malaysia, for example, I can go back in time and I can see what's moved both in the past and most recently. And I can use the same sensors or different ones, depending on the application, to move forward and give you regular updates through time. Again, not real time, but as rapidly as I can based on the acquisition frequency of the satellite. So you'll see here some various different numbers, and these are in days. So the fastest satellites at the moment are every 11 days per satellite unit. So it is possible to get faster revisiting times because in some cases, like in Cosmos SkyMed, we have three sensors that are still active, and we've got CSG, which has got two sensors. So it is possible to get imagery, not let's say several images per day, but down to every few days, um, depending on the the budget as well because some satellites are free and some satellites are commercial and therefore they've got a commercial cost so all these factors can come into play um, when we're looking to detect a millimeter per year on a slow creeping landslide we don't need an image every single day um, we need an image every week or so because the um, chances of it suddenly accelerating um, are pretty low if there is a chance of it accelerating rapidly, then we could monitor as fast as possible. However, that would have an increased cost in terms of the data element. And if you need a real-time system anyway, we'd go for a ground-based a ground -based system. So it's the integration of these technologies, identifying the slow creeps, the slow movements um, that would help. That is the real principal application here of, of the INSA, um, especially for slow monitoring. And when it comes down to um, construction project monitoring, again, regular updates at the frequency of the satellite um, uh, not typically suffice for the kind of displacements that we're looking to identify as in long-term displacements in the ranges of a millimeter per year or up to a few meters per year maximum. Anything faster than that and it will be outside of the range of uh, INSA. So um, on a schematic kind of point of view, satellite um, is in space, passes on day one, takes a distance measurement from the satellite to the, to the ground, in this case a building, and back again. Um, there are two elements to every single satellite image. One is phase, which is basically this sinusoidal wave. Uh, and then the second one is the amplitude. So how strong the signal is that came back. So if I'm looking at water, I will see nothing because we can't get points over water. All the energy basically dissipates in most cases. Um, over a building, a very strong reflector, I'll be able to see it and it will give me a very strong reflection. So from very strong to zero, we can get a very wide range of different displacements. Um, and that's from the amplitude side. From the phase, um, it depends on the distance from the satellite to the object that is reflecting. So every time the satellite passes, it knows what the object is that it is monitoring. And we use that from the amplitude imagery. We detect that by looking at what the pixel is and the characteristics of the return signal and say, OK, I know that's the same building as the previous image and the previous one before that. How is it moving, though? I want to see the phase. So as the distance between um, the object and the satellite changes, assuming the building has settled, for example, um, I will see a shift in the phase. And because we know the um, wavelength of the satellite that we're using, it's not simple, but um, to put it simply, um, we calculate the shift in terms of phase shift, which is calculated um, knowing the wavelength of the satellite and then, of course, the shift in the phase. So using this approach, certainly for the X-band and C-band satellites, a very, very small shift in ground movement is related to a few degrees of movement in terms of the phase, and therefore it is perfectly feasible that you can detect a millimeter of displacement on the ground from a satellite, agreed, once you've removed all of the particular errors that can come into it. And there it will come down to the individual INSAR provider's expertise, processing chain, and uh, ability to process the different data sets. So without going too much into the physics, it is perfectly feasible to monitor a millimeter of displacement um, of an object on the ground through time from a satellite that is um, 800 kilometers above the surface. 
So what is a standard insight deliverable and what does it look like? So I mentioned we have nothing on the ground. All we see from our uh, office, wherever that would be, and normally we have a processing chain which is in the cloud. So really we don't see the ground itself at all. We take the imagery that's acquired over an area, we process the imagery for the period of time that the client is interested in, and then we provide them with the data set. The data set is a discrete set of measurement points. Each one of these uh, colored dots on the screen that you can see, and I hope the quality is good enough on your end, is a single discrete measurement point. Each measurement point has its position in terms of data that we provide, X, Y, and Z, with um, standard deviations on each of those three um, calculations, um, which the first point of every single time series is always zero. Then we have an annual displacement rate of that particular point through time, and then a time series of displacement. So for the period of time that we have processed, if I go back uh, one year over Kuala Lumpur, so that's January last year to the end of December last year, for example, I will then look at the velocities of all the measurement points in all the data set and I will then create a scale color bar that allows me to color code these measurement points according to their movement for that one year. Generally speaking, the standardized uh, color scale is green is stable, so it hasn't moved really within the limitations of the technology. Blue is moving towards the satellite, so we need to be careful when we say um, vertical movement um just consider the uplift here is in most cases towards the satellite which is along the satellite line of sight and then um, red is subsidence so moving away again not true vertical necessarily depending on the data set you choose and i will explain that but red is normally moving away orange means it's moving slower red means it's moving faster for the period of time that i have processed so in this uh snapshot this this um let's say uh, temporal map that I'm giving you of movement. Each of these measurement points has a database and it has the time series of movement. Now, every single point starts with zero. So with my measurement point, this is different to the deliverable that you would get from a, from a, from a prism or from a leveling survey. With every new datum you get from a leveling survey or a, or, a, or a prism, for example, you get a new X, Y, and Z position. INSAR doesn't provide that. INSAR provides you with X, Y, and Z at the beginning, which is always zero in terms of movement. X, Y, and is obviously latitude and longitude and height, but your, your movement is zero. So we consider that to be zero. And then I give you the movement from time zero every time the satellite acquires. And each one of these dots on the time series is a new satellite acquisition. So here we've got, let's say, the end of 2014. Uh, and we've got all the way through April, July, October, then 2016. So we've got about a year and a half here, <laughs> a year and uh, eight months, perhaps. Over that year and eight months, for these two areas, I can see that this is actually Kansai Airport in Japan. These are two reclaimed areas. So this one here was built first because now it's settled enough that it is not moving as fast as the area that was built late, later and is still consolidating relatively rapidly. So for these data sets here, I can see that this area here is consolidated by 261 millimeters in the one uh, per year. So over the total period, we see around 400 uh, millimeters of sediment. Whereas for the area that was built first, we see a slower um, velocity here of 45 millimeters per year. So those are the standard deliverables. <laughs> Excuse me. What that means in terms of um, geotechnical uh, risk, for example, is not up to your inside provider to determine. The inside company is an instrumentation company and they will provide you the data set. They will, of course, explain how the data has been calculated, um, what the accuracies are, and what they observe in the data set, but they can't tell you why um, it's been like that. Um, right, so why would you consider using INSAR? First of all, it's completely remote. So that means we don't install anything on the ground. We don't need to send people in to maintain uh, the instrumentations or take data, data points, and that's a lower risk from that point of view. And even once you've finished, let's say, uh, a survey, um, uh, you've installed maybe prisms, you need to then remove those as well. 
So there's nothing on the ground in 99% of the cases. Um, the cases where you would need something on the ground is when it's completely covered in snow um, or where um, the ground is so vegetated that we can't get any signal back from an InSAR satellite. Um, but those are very few and far between those cases. Um, it's millimeter accuracy. So this is very comparable to your in-situ instrumentation. Um, as the next point states, complementary. Again, we're not trying to compete. It is absolutely feasible that we could in some areas where we know that INSAR is covering an area uh, that needs to be monitored and you have perhaps some in-situ in instrumentation in that area and it's well covered with INSAR. You have measurement points where you need to be um, observing displacements. Um, and you don't need the in-situ instrumentation that can either be downsized or then shifted to a different area where you might want to um, capitalize on that on that in-situ instrument. Um, but in generally speaking, we would use INSAR to optimize the location. So where do I need to detect ground movement? Where is it not covered with INSAR? Where is it covered with INSAR and then optimize? Um, what else we can do is identify areas that are not, that have blind spots, for example. So if you need to really um, put an instrument in a certain area um, that isn't covered by INSAR, then we can identify which areas are not covered with the INSAR. Um, or in areas that are non-time critical areas. So if you are, it, um, if it's okay to see, let's say, slow displacements in millimeters per year, then fine, INSAR is a solution for that. There's a high density of measurement points and we'll, I'll show you some comparisons as well. Um, certainly on an economic scale, uh, no in-situ in -situ instrument can reach the density of measurement points for INSAR. Whether we find the points in the right area or not, of course, comes down to each individual project. Depending on the size of the project area as well, because uh, the satellite imagery literally covers several kilometers and kilometers by, so several hundred square kilometers per tile, uh, per image that we buy, uh, normally, a project, for example, like a metro station, is actually for us a very small area. So if you're looking for wider area uh, geotechnical analyses, for example, then INSAR really is a very strong tool from that, that point of view. Um, and then, of course, you've got the um, historical data sets. INSAR is the only technology that can go back in time. With an in-situ instrument, you only get the data once you've installed the instrument. But whereas INSAR has been acquiring for uh, many decades, the most relevant data sets over Malaysia, certainly since around 2015, 2016. So we've still got several years of data um, that can go back in time, either understand complicated uh, phenomena that have happened in the past, or that data set can be used to start regular forward monitoring, basically right from the word go. So those are a list of reasons why you might want to consider using INSAR. And the applications for civil engineering, um, we, we have been through a few already, and I'll just throw all these points up on the screen. Um, already. I did mention already that for the pre-construction baseline, so what, and here's an example down the bottom which I'll show you in a few slides, what happened before you started building? Whilst you're actively constructing, INSAR can be used to detect early any indications of instabilities that perhaps aren't identified from in-situ instruments because budget doesn't allow instruments to be installed in every single location. Separate displacements from one project to another. So if you've got two companies working on two different projects or the same project, one next to each other, how they would each have their own independent in situ instrumental data sets. So is it is it always possible to say that um, because you're only monitoring in a small area that doesn't affect the area outside the area that you're monitoring and vice versa? So could one company be affecting the displacements also of the other company, especially if things like dewatering are involved? Because we capture a wide area, the geotechnical zone of influence can be very clearly seen from a satellite. And I've mentioned already, optimize and reduce and verify in situ instrumentation. Um, the last point here I make is INSAR has become increasingly used for, dis uh, for dispute resolution and for damage liability. So where a claim has been made against a construction company, INSAR can be used um, as a very strong argument to say, look, this is what was moving beforehand and our construction only contributed to this amount of movement, or we didn't cause any movement on that area at all and it's a false claim, or indeed the inside data can be used to confirm, in some cases, the uh, damage that uh, a construction company has, has caused. So um, from that edge, really the data is telling the truth, so it, it can also be a double-edged sword from that point of view. So here's a local example um, over the Klang Valley. So Kuala Lumpur city is in the central area here. This is an analysis we did uh, a year and a half ago. 
Um, we wanted to see the density of measurement points over uh, the Klang Valley, but over the wider area. So bear in mind, this is about 70 or 80 kilometers here. So point number one is a very dense network of measurement points over the wide area. You will notice there are areas of red, which are typically moving away from the satellite. And there are areas, there is a small area here of blue, which I believe is some level of industrial um, activity. You will also notice some areas where we get very little measurement points. Um, so again, this is application based. This was what we would call a scoping analysis to see what's the general trends of movement of the entire Klang area. Um, there are very slow creeps in this area. Um, and what would be the density of measurement points over this area? With this particular satellite, it wasn't designed for high resolution, very high density of measurement points over uh, civil engineering projects or over the city urban area proper. It was looking for a wide area analysis. If we did want to use this application for um, civil engineering analysis, we would have gone for a higher resolution satellite. Likewise, for slopes and vegetated slopes specifically, this satellite would be most inappropriate because it simply attenuates in areas, which is why we get all these pockets of empty holes. Um, it simply attenuates when there are uh, vegetated areas. So the choice of satellite is critical for the accuracy of the results and the correct density of measurement points. But just to show you a quick application here, um, this is a road uh, that was built. Um, these are, I believe there's a palm plantation, so the road was built through this area. We processed the data from 2019, if you can see on your screens, to 2022. So it's only a two and a half hour, two and a half year data set. Uh, uh, yeah, two and a half year data set. Um, we don't find any measurement points with this satellite over this kind of ground, which is absolutely normal. The interesting story here is that this road here was built on what was uh, presumably con still consolidating ground, hence the ground has moved away from the satellite and it's red, indicated red. This is a toll booth area. And what was interesting here, we've got power lines that run into this complex here from a power station, I imagine. Each of these are pylons that we're picking up. Um, not the cable itself, because the cable itself is too small to be seen, and indeed it moves through time far too much and inconsistently for us to say that's the same area that's moving, so we can't monitor the cable itself, but the pylons, yes. What's interesting here is that the bridge area, uh, the bridge area was built with deep piles, so it was more stable and didn't consolidate through time, whereas the road itself clearly had no piles um, and was just built on consolidated ground. So we get this very interesting kind of contrast between the area where there was the bridge, which had the piles, and then the area which was just the road, which was still um, uh, still consolidating. Now, this is um, the platform from one particular provider, of course. <laughs> Excuse me again. If uh, whichever insight provider you use will have a different platform, perhaps, or will have uh, different tools on their platform, if indeed they have a platform. So for this particular uh, provider, um, they have a wide range of tools where you've got a time slider and a cross-section tool here. So I've taken a cross-section down from the north down to the southeast down here just to show um, what are the differential displacements like um, along that line. So as we come from the northern area, we see some compaction through time. So this is time zero and this is two and a half years later. So this is both time and settlement. So the darker the blue is the time, the lighter the blue is the earlier. So blue, the darker blue is later at the end of the 2020, the middle of 2022. The lighter turquoise is the beginning of 2019. And then the distances from, from left to right here is from the top, as in the north, and then down to the south. So we know that the maximum area of displacement for that cross section came in this area here. But what is interesting is that the area where the bridge comes through, we see some fairly big um, differential displacements, which could lead to potentially cracking in that area of the structure. And the other interesting part is the consolidation, which runs down from around this area here, which is here, all the way down to the bottom here. There's really quite a low, um, a slow, but yet quite um, clear area that's still in sediment. Whether this is a problem for the asset, again, I know inside providers are data instrumentation companies. They can't tell you why or if that's a problem for the road, but they can indicate the total amount of cumulative displacement for that period. And there's a time slider here that if I was on the platform, I could drag back and I could see how the profile changed through time. So it's telling me a story about how the ground is moving through that period in time. Uh, another example um, uh, is KLIA. 
this is a time series uh, and a cross section down the runway. Um, again, this is the same uh, time period, to the beginning of 2019 up until um, May 2022. What is very interesting is that there are some really quite strong differential displacements in this area here and then through the central area here. Um, now, there are international standards for runways, and I don't know if this is due to consolidation of the ground post-construction of the runway, or indeed if this is certain areas where the, the runways, where the planes land continuously, and this is a high impact area, and therefore we start to see more sediment in this area. Needless to say, there's quite a significant, this is 200 millimeters, right? Um, so um, over that, over that cross section, there's quite an, a, a decent amount of uh, differential displacement. Once you get past the midpoint, basically it doesn't uh, move and it's remained stable for the last two and a half years. So those were some local examples. This is a standard resolution satellite and I will show you high resolution and indeed what we would call standard wide resolution satellites, which can detect more measurement points in the um, vegetated areas. I wanna bring on a few technical considerations here um, because I think when, if you have uh, an open discussion with an insight provider, then they should go through the different types of options that are available, as well as um, the limitations of each approach, right? Because there is no such thing as a perfect insight system. It won't give you um, real time, uh, extremely accurate uh, displacements everywhere across your map. That is, a, that is a fact. What we can do is tailor the project and the satellite and the processing chain to best fit the requirements of your project. So hopefully these few slides will help you um, determine uh, also before you just have a discussion with NSR company what the available options are. So I've already mentioned that the satellite actually, as you can imagine, is on a north-south uh, polar orbit. It's, it's on a north-south orbit because it's got the solar panels. It's constantly emitting an active rad uh, radar signal, so it needs power not only to um, to emit the radar signal down to the ground, but also to receive the satellite, the, the reflected radar signal, and then to download it to a base station as it flies over. So this is quite a power intensive process. So it's facing north, south, so it's always facing the sun. Um, so it's always got power. And um, what this means is, um, as you saw in the animation down here, this, the earth rotates and the satellite um, goes on north, south. So a combination of those two allows us to basically revisit the same project area, for example, um, take a snapshot over Kuala Lumpur every few days. Now with that satellite that I showed you before, that passes every 12 days. Other satellites can pass quicker than that. But what it means is that we basically split the two acquisitions into what we would call an ascending satellite acquisition. So when it passes from the South Pole to the North Pole, please remember that the satellite has a line of sight and 90% of satellites look right. What that means is when it comes from the, the same satellite, right, um, covering the same Earth, comes down the other side from the descending side, from the North Pole to the South Pole, we call that descending, it's looking right. So basically, if we're looking at Kuala Lumpur, I'm actually looking at Kuala Lumpur from, from the east and then from the west. So each one of these geometries, we call it, is called 1D line of sight. So one dimensional line of sight. And if you remember the line of sight from the second or third slide showed me um, the angle it's looking at, it's exactly the same satellite looking at exactly the same angle. It's just that it's upside down coming from the bottom of the earth as opposed to um, looking from the top of the earth, right? So we get, to, we get to basically view every project from two different angles, which does have a big uh, advantage for us. Um, however, it is important to know what each 1D line of sight will give you in terms of displacement monitoring. So if this is the real movement of the ground, D real, displacement real, this is my curve, let's say it's a, it's a slope. This is where, this is the direction, the magnitude um, of this vector where the real ground has moved. This is, I'm considering the ascending satellite. So the ascending, like I mentioned, is coming from the South Pole to the North Pole and it's looking right. So basically in this plain view here, it's flying into the screen and it's flying away from us. It's looking along its line of sight. The displacement that it will really measure is the um, projection of the real displacement along the line of sight. So the first thing you notice is the vector is different. It's in a different direction. It's always along the satellite's line of sight and it's got a different magnitude. In this particular case here, it's got a lower magnitude 
and it's pointing down along the satellite's line of sight, which can be from 20 to 40 degrees. We simply take that data, we color code it according to its displacement, away from the satellite is red, towards the satellite is blue, like you saw in the previous nomenclature, and that's the way that we deliver our 1D line of sight displacements. The same is true for a descending satellite. Here's my same displacement. Descending satellite is coming now towards us from the screen. It's coming from the South Pole to the North Pole and it's looking right. It looks like it look, it's looking left here, but it's coming towards us and it's actually looking right. So what does this satellite see? Well, the same displacement, this satellite will actually see an uplift. So it looks like the ground is moving towards the satellite and is lifting up, but of course it's not. We know the real displacement, it has a very strong, uh, if we consider um, this would be a easterly displacement, it's got a very strong easterly displacement, which means that it looks like it's moving towards the satellite. Um, so this is what we call a 1D descending data set, again, line of sight. This doesn't mean that ascending is better than descending or that descending is no good in this particular case. It simply means that when we're looking at an inside data set, I need to know which angle I'm looking from so that I can best interpret the results if I use a 1D data set. If there are no horizontal displacements, no east and west movement, then it's perfectly acceptable to use a single 1D data set. However, if there are strong east and west displacements and you need to quantify them, then we can use both satellites. And this is the major advantage here. Remember, we've got our descending, sorry, our ascending line of sight. We've got our descending line of sight. And once we've color coded them both, we can then put them together and through relatively simple trigonometry with some pseudo cell sub subsampling, we can come up with a true vertical displacement and a true horizontal or east and west displacement grid. So now I know I've got my 1D ascending data set, I've got my 1D descending data set, I've got my 2D vertical and horizontal. At this point, I should make it very clear that um, sat INSAR satellites are completely blind to perfect north-south movements, simply because they're coming along the north-south angle and they're looking perpendicular out to the right. There are ways to um, detect less accurately vertical, um, sorry, um, north-south movement, but that, and that's more along a pixel tracking approach, which can be done, but we're talking about several centimeters of accuracy and not millimeters of accuracy. And at the moment, there are no satellites that circumnavigate the globe along the equator, which would be the satellite required for that um, particular uh, analysis, right? So right now we're limited to the two 1D analyses and then of course the 2D vertical and horizontal. Um, if we're looking at a project, for example, a tunneling project, um, and we're only really expecting vertical settlement, then we can quite happily take a 1D data set and then, if, and then look at the displacements along the 1D line of sight. Um, and if we really need uh, absolute displacements, we can simply project the line of sight displacement to the vertical, uh, obtaining the correct magnitude of displacement. However, we need to make the assumption that there's no horizontal displacement. And that will really come down when you speak to your inside provider, you'll say, what kind of data sets do you want? Um, in the cases, in the case where the satellite data is free, this data impact is very low or negligible or zero. What there will be is the case that you process one data set and you process another data set and then you put them together. In the case where you have data which is high resolution or commercial data sets that you need to pay for, then you've not only got two sets of processing, but you've also got two sets of data to pay for. Um, it very much depends on what the requirement is for the specific project where vertical and horizontal are required. 2D is your only option. Um, this is actually a mining site, but this, this shows pr pretty uh, nicely the differences in the different data sets that we can obtain. So this is what we'll call a 2D analysis. So we've got our ascending, which shows red moving away from the satellite um, in a very different area to where we've got red in the descending satellite. We've also got blue in the descending satellite. So in this case, um, if we remember what I said a slide ago, when I'm looking at the blue, I can also consider there's probably a very strong horizontal component, most likely out towards, in this case, the east, which is exactly the case. When I put the two data sets together, the ascending and the descending, I obtain the vertical and the horizontal. So here, this is true vertical, real magnitude vertical displacement, again, blind to north-south. It's only a 2D vector, not a 3D vector. But we also see that we have this um, 
uh, blue movement towards the east. So this was what we call a waste pile. So it was dumped material that was compacting, but also shifting into the pit, which is um, obviously a void. Another thing that was interesting that popped out of this data set was there's also an area here that's slowly moving into the pit towards the west. So in this case, in a mining example, normally the standard deliverable is a 2D displacement because we expect very complicated um, 2D east and west um, and vertical displacement. So a 1D data set would not be sufficient. In civil engineering, um, the decision can sometimes be a little bit easier in the sense that we don't necessarily always need 2D. But again, um, that's a discussion to have with uh, your inside provider about the specific deliverables. But I'm um, informing you today about the different options that are available. Um, and let's look at the satellite resolutions as well. Now, this is not an exhaustive list. Um, there are some satellites here called Terrace RX, Cosmos Skymed, RadarSat, and then Sentinel. Um, Sentinel, as it happens as a European Space Agency, is free. In some areas of the world, it acquires one image every six days, other areas every 12, and it has a pixel size. So a ground footprint of 20 by five meters. So that's 100 square meters. What does this mean? This means that when my satellite passes and it takes a picture, I, for each pixel, I am getting an average movement of 100 square meters. So if I give you one measurement point, irregardless of how big I put that pixel on the GIS database or the online platform, irrespective of how big that pixel is, I'm still giving you an average movement of 100 square meters. And this is an important consideration to take. What is the smallest size area that I would really like to see? Or what is the area, the size of the area below which it's not a problem if I don't monitor it with INSAR? Because if, if 100 square meters is too big, then that means that we need to go to a higher resolution solution. So radar sat, this particular resolution, and then the Sentinel satellite are both standard resolution. These three examples here are uh, high resolution satellites, and then very high resolutions of these two modes here, what we call spotlight, um, where you get a one by one meter. So there are really quite significant differences here between capturing movement of 100 square meters and bear in mind that if I'm, I'm taking a sensible approach I will never just look at one data point I'll look at several so maybe four or five I need maybe 500 square meters in movement before a standard resolution satellite will give me the the, uh, the information I need compared to um, a high resolution maybe three by three so nine square meters or one by one, one square meter, I can then see five pixels would be five square meters. So that's a significantly smaller area in movement that I can detect with a higher resolution satellite. And these are just considerations. Again, the repeat cycles are pretty much the same for all of them. And when it comes to a long-term project, and most of these are multi-year, uh, the, ac the acquisition frequency of the satellite is, is not always the most important factor. This is what the satellite sees. Um, the higher resolution can clearly see um, a lot more detail. Again, it comes down to the TV concept. Um, lower resolution TV, less clear the picture, higher resolution, higher density pixels, the better I can depict one smaller area of movement compared to another one. So I'll just show this clearly again in the demonstration of um, uh, the pixel sizes of the different types of satellites. And that was not an exhaustive list. It was just the most common ones for standard resolution and wide area mapping. Uh, here we've got the 20 by 5. So if we assume an area in movement on a slope, uh, which is 30 by 30 or 10 by 15, um, the standard resolution will really just see um, uh, two pixels, which may or may not suffice in terms of um, accuracy or confidence in what's moving on the ground. A 3 by 3, we'll see a decent level of accuracy. Um, and then the um, higher resolution, one by one or 1.2 by 1.8, depending on the resolution you choose, can then see really quite a detailed picture and captures almost perfectly the movement that is moving on the ground, assuming we see coherent reflections from that area. OK, and there are a number of caveats to that, but um, that I hope that makes a clear um, understanding of the differences between the different satellites. Um, most civil engineering projects um, that we use use this resolution here. It's a brilliant compromise between size of area that you can monitor and small size of area in movement. 
right? Uh, what these two satellite data sets here are normally around the same cost. Um, this one here is, is free. These two here are normally around the same cost, but the trade-off for the very high resolution um, is that you basically get the same number of pixels. It's just that the smaller the pixel means that the frame size is smaller. So if you have a, a, a hundred kilometers of road that you want to monitor, um, this is most inappropriate or will be very expensive um, because you'll need several tiles of satellite if it can acquire over your asset to cover the asset adequately. Whereas um, the standard resolution or normally the uh, medium, this, the high resolution, but three by three, not very high resolution, um, can normally find a decent economic balance between that. Most projects fall under one satellite tile. Where the area is very small, we can use for the same cost the extremely high resolution data. And in terms of density of measurement points, basically you get what you pay for. Again, remember the compromise between very high resolution and then high resolution in terms of density of points and the size of the tile. Um, it's only fair and professional to uh, mention the limitations of InSAR. So I have mentioned a few times here satellite repeat time, right? Um, actually, in the InSAR world, um, we don't really see this as a limitation. The only reason why we note it here is because we're asked several times, can you please give us daily InSAR results? The answer is no, I can't until I get a satellite that passes every day. Um, we are getting faster and faster satellites, considering at the beginning they used to pass every 36 days, I think it was, and then down to 24, and then now sometimes 16, and then 11, and then 8, and then sometimes 4, and then 1, depending on the satellite, but we haven't got regular everyday satellite imagery. Um, it may well be the case that they get faster and faster. At the moment, again, we're looking at millimeters per year. So the difference there is simply how quickly I can give you an update. Um, if the satellite passed every day, I might still only process every month, once a month. So it would take 30 or 31 data points as opposed to um, two or three, depending if it was an 11 day satellite. Again, it's the number of time, time data points on a time series. So it's simply the accuracy of information we're giving, but really in terms of millimeters per year, from our point of view, it doesn't affect the accuracy of the results. They're still millimetric, um, but this is more a perception of Oh, I can get GPS points every two minutes, so why can't I get that on Insa? Uh, vegetation, uh, we do have a solution for vegetation. Uh, like I said, 99% of projects don't have anything on the ground. Where we really have snow or high vegetation, we can install a reflector. It's not normally the case, and anyway, most civil engineering projects, uh, we're looking at the um, built infrastructure to monitor and not uh, the vegetated ground. But even when we do have let's say low enough vegetated ground, we do have a satellite which wasn't listed on the previous slides, which can penetrate better through the vegetation. Uh, they're called L-band and they have a much longer wavelength which penetrates through the vegetation. Not always perfect results, but yet much, much improved on the higher resolution or standard resolution satellites. Again, um, speak to your inside provider and they will suggest the most appropriate satellite for uh, the application that you're looking into. Uh, Significant or rapid groundworks. So um, this is a, actually the one Bangkok uh, shopping center in, in, in Bangkok. Um, it was being built during the time that we processed this data. We were actually asked to process this data because the embassy here in the north, to the north of the, um, to the north of the void which had been created, and now in this particular optical base image, we can see the buildings being built, but when we did the analysis, there was actually quite a deep void. The embassy was slowly falling into the um, void cracks were appearing on the uh, on the building. So we were asked to process the data to verify the, the movement of the building and the time of onset of the displacement. And I'll explain that over the next half an hour through um, the example application slides. Um, but needless to say, when you have rapid changes on the ground, if this is a one year data set, if you significantly change the ground as they did do uh, by creating the void and then filling in with concrete and the foundations and then building buildings, I'm going to lose the measurement points because I need to see the consistent reflection through that period of time. It's very similar to if you place a prism on the ground and then you dump earth on top of it. You're not going to get a measurement from the prism anymore. Likewise, if you um, put um, you excavate over your, your leveling benchmark, you no longer have that benchmark to measure from and therefore you will be losing the data set for that area. The difference being that you can place a new leveling benchmark whenever you want and you can place a new prism whenever you want, whereas for a satellite data set, 
we need to wait several weeks or months before that data point might come back in again. Um, or at least we need to wait until the ground has stopped being changed. And then we have to wait four or five months after that to get measurement points on that area that's been built. There are other techniques that can be used um, to capture wider displacements uh, faster than that. But in terms of accurate millimeter per year uh, time series, we need at least six months of data before we can get accurate um, measurements and an accurate time series. Uh, and here, um, uh, this is not really a major issue because uh, we're not really looking at monitoring substance of water. Um, flooding, where the flooding does come in, yes, we'll lose the measurement points for that period, but it's not too common. Um, and snow is definitely not too common in Malaysia. So these are not massive issues. But the reason why we don't get data over water is because the signal comes down and bounces off and nothing comes back to the satellite. So in all fairness, um, those are the limitations of INSAR. Um, uh, and I mention these because uh, normally during projects, people will say, oh, can I get measurement point in that area that I just completed last week? The answer is yes, but you need to wait six months until you finish changing it, and then I can give you the, um, the information. How does data, how does inside data fit with in situ instrumentation? Um, and then I'll move on to a few applications. Um, I've put here four other technologies which are realistically um, three with GPS data here. This is real near real time and then of course manual. Um, and I've broken it down into spatial density of measurement points, the temporal acquisition of uh, data. So how often can I give you a result? The accuracy, what kind of measurement we give you, and then do we need ground instrumentation or not? Um, and you can read this last uh, part on your own. So in terms of the density of measurement points, like I alluded to before, tens to uh, hundreds to tens of thousands of measurement points per square kilometer. This will depend on the ground conditions, this will depend on uh, what's changed on the ground, and this will depend on the satellite resolution you use. But um, there are no other technologies that will be able to reach that level of density of measurement points. It is also fair to say that you can put an instrument wherever you want, and if you need to know a very specific corner of a building, you should install an in-situ instrument on that bit part of the building because I cannot guarantee, as an inside point of view, from an inside point of view, that I will be able to guarantee you a measurement point on that area, or indeed, if I'm seeing a measurement point in that particular pixel, that it is that specific corner of the building that is reflecting. Um, because it it's, can be a very complicated uh, reflection process of bouncing between um, buildings and then being reflected back to the satellite is what we're monitoring. As long as we're seeing the same reflection every time the satellite passes, that's the measurement point that we're going to be giving you. But for wide area coverage, sure, INSAR definitely um, is, a, is a very strong competitor. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, the temporal acquisition frequency here, like I mentioned on the previous slide, we're really weekly to monthly. So Normally, we can provide data every um, eight or 11 days, depending on the, the application. But for a civil engineering project, it could be every month. Once a month, I give you a map about what's changed on the ground over that month. Compared to GNSS, <coughs> manual GNSS, we can have quarterly data. Or if you've got real-time GNSS, then it's every hour or daily. Very, very rich data sets. Um, Leveling as often as you send the team out, of course, it has a cost, and then tilt meter would be continuous. So there, of course, there are more um, instruments that, that I haven't included in this table here, um, and there was no particular bias. These were just the, 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 the major, the, the major um, uh, instruments that we were asked to compare our data to. On an accuracy level, um, millimeters per year for all of them. Um, I've mentioned already. You will be familiar with the existing ones, right? So leveling um, data sets and, and tilt meters, and then the, the GNSS. Uh, you'll be familiar with these already. Um, I have discussed, and I hope I've made it clear enough, the points between 1D line of sight, which is not vertical, and then 2D, where we get vertical and east and west displacements. I'm happy to answer questions again if that's not clear at the end. The major point here, of course, is that we don't need anything on the ground, whereas with um, uh, other instrumentation, we do. And of course, they have different ranges of costs depending on the instrument that you want. Um, so I've been asked to show some slides here, integration of the data sets with different um, in-situ instruments. So we've got on the left-hand side here, uh, GPS, which is the orange, and then we've got the blue, which is the INSAR. Now, I already mentioned that um, you can only get instrument uh, data from an in-situ instrument once you've installed it, uh, which of course is obvious. Um, however, 
one of the advantages of using INSAR here is that because the data goes back in time, you can simply just take the imagery that's been acquired already and then process that data. And then you can use that to overlay a starting point for your GPS point, because we don't, in this particular example, because we don't really know um, how much the ground moved before you installed the GPS point. So if you've got a project that's been running for six or eight months, for example, and then you install a GPS point or an inclinometer here or the leveling station here, we don't really know what's happened in between the points when we started and stopped the in-situ instruments. If you've got a continuous long-term inside data set, that can be extremely useful. And I will show that in a couple of slides. Again, here's inclinometer. Admittedly, this data set here was from a slightly older satellite and it was slightly noisier. But still, the general trend is very clear to see. We've got relatively slow displacement, and then we see an acceleration. This is leveling, and I'll show you um, in more detail in uh, in, a, in a slide. Green is the is the level is the is the inside data set, and then we've got two different leveling data sets from two different companies. Here we have prisms on the side of a station. Just another example. Um, here we have. Uh, red is a red is ah uh, here we go. Um, sorry, here's um red is one measurement point, and black is another measurement point. You will see that there is slightly different displacements between um, these two data sets. One is the um, prism, and one is the inside. Again, remember that we're looking from a different looking angle. So the satellite is looking from above. The prism is is built on the on the side of the building there. So we are measuring the same real ground displacement from two different instruments with two different slight looking angles, but still the general trend here um, agrees, agrees pretty nicely. The differences here are simply down to the um, looking angles of the, of the instruments. Um, I mentioned before as well um, on the previous example where the leveling data set was compared with INSAR. Um, if I look at this area here, here we've got um, the INSAR approach for area A and then the leveling approach for area A, not in exactly the same spot, but very near. And then we've got the INSAR approach, and this is the particular um, INSAR processing chain of the company that I represent called Squeezer. And then we've got the leveling survey, which is this area here. So they're both again in similar areas. Blue is the leveling, green is the INSAR data. So first of all, the leveling data started um, at this period here around February 2012, continued for around a year and a bit and then stopped. And then started again in 2016 and then stopped again. Like I mentioned before, when you come back and do the second leveling survey, it's almost impossible without the INSAR survey to know exactly where you started from, where, where you should integrate that with, as they did on this second area down here in location B. The trend is the same, the data sets agree, they're both showing the same trend, but leveling starts from zero in this case. But of course, if we didn't have the inside data, we wouldn't have known how much the ground has actually moved throughout these two cycles of dewatering. This is actually London. They were dewatering the first cycle, building the tunnel, dewatering again the second time. Um, and the trends agree, but with the leveling survey, they started at zero because they had no other data reference point to start from. Um, and they could quite happily align that to the inside data. So I hope that shows a clear understanding about how the data sets can be integrated together. Again, INSAR is not looking to um, remove in situ instrumentation. Um, in the interest of time, I've got about 20 minutes left. I'm just going to go through some applications now. These are examples of INSAR data sets for commercial projects and non-commercial projects. So I ask you again not to, 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 to take any screenshots of this imagery. I will pass across a PDF of these slides at the end. Um, I just wanted to highlight how the inside data has helped a problem of a client in the past. So um, this is a metro line. They had uh, conducted pre-construction surveys, but um, this area here had a significant amount of natural ground sediment prior to the construction. It was not picked up on the baseline study. They came to us and said, excuse, can you give us a data set what's happened in the past? Because none of our leveling data makes any sense. If I zoom into this area, the metro line runs through this white area here. This is the construction of a station area. Throughout the period of the historical analysis that we performed, they significantly changed this area on the ground, which is why we don't find the measurement points consistent with what I explained before. So there was some ground works in this area. But what we can see is pre-construction, there's a very wide area, red bowl, 
in this area here, which is showing very strong uh, historical settlement. This is the point where the groundworks started. And we can see a very small impact from the um, actual groundworks, but we see a very large existing natural um, instability or substance phenomena prior to the onset of groundworks. So once the client saw this, they said, okay, that makes a lot of sense now why our leveling data isn't making sense. Um, tunnel monitoring in general, I'll show you an example of a crossrail. Um, you'll most likely all be familiar with the crossrail project east to west over London. Um, we have a, 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 a time lapse here. So we process the entire data period uh, for a historical baseline. So this was to get a long-term baseline about what's moved before they started uh, analysis identify any existing spot issues and then determine if there are any buildings that are already moving or not that's the historical study throughout the monitoring which is what you can see here um, as the red line started acquiring it's a time lapse of settlement through time and how the how the sediment developed through time you get a very wide uh, density of measurement points this is a high resolution satellite that was used for this one client feedback was more points for less money. So for them, it was a bit of a no-brainer in terms of wide area monitoring, right? They used the data set to optimize and in some cases reduce the in-situ in -situ instrumentation in areas where it was well covered with the INSAR. And because this is such a wide project um, with so many different contractors, each contractor was required to provide in-situ instrumentation uh, data to the Crossrail company. They used INSAR as a blanket neutral data set for the wide area coverage to which then compare every in, in situ instrument data set to compare and validate um, the, each individual company's um, uh, in situ instrumentation. And then post construction, it was okay, we can see here Bond Street, Tottenham Court Road, Liverpool Street, Whitechapel, all of these are station areas. In those station areas, they will have created movement and they want to check post construction is the ground compacting and behaving in the way that they want. Can they downsize on the in situ instrumentation, which led to less feet on the ground and then hence a cost saving? So, those are the three major areas that, in, in fact, the Crossrail example is a nice example because it covers all three stages of the project for a civil engineering case. So it's quite clear in terms of that uh, offering. I'll show you some of the data. If we zoom in on this area here, actually when Crossrail came through, there were two tunneling projects that basically happened within a few years of each other. The Brick Lane project here, north, um, south to north, approximately. And then we've got the Crossrail, which runs east to west. So if we look at the data um, that was for the same period, um, throughout the period of construction of both tunnels, this is what the time series looks like. So we've taken an average of points for the Brick Lane project here, which are turquoise. As the Brick Lane tunnel comes through, as it goes from south to north, everything is stable beforehand. And then as we see the tunnel come through from the Brick Lane, we start to see the settlement profile. First an acceleration, then a slowing and a slow deceleration back to what is almost completely settled. As Crossrail comes in from the east through to the west, first we hit the, blue, the green point and then we hit the red point as the tunnel boring machine works its way from east to west, or indeed there may even have been more than one tunnel boring machine. I will admit I'm not an expert on that. Um, the green point starts moving first and then a few months later we get the red point moving as well. Um, the data here was confirmed with in situ instrumentation. All of it made sense. The question was, however, what happened to the buildings that were stuck right above the confluence of the two tunnel joints? Because there were several claims. How much damage was due to Brick Lane? How much damage was due to Crossrail? Again, Brick Lane comes through. This is now a single measurement point over the building. Um, stable to start with, confirmation of the fact that there was no movement before. Brick Lane comes through, the, the area starts to move, and then as Crossrail comes through, we see a second acceleration. So we can almost quantify here how much, or in fact we can quantify here, how much um, ground movement was caused by the first tunnel and then how much additional, <laughs> excuse me, uh, movement was caused by the second tunnel. You will note that the um, ground had not stopped moving at the time when the second tunnel came through. So the amount of damage here um, claimed um, and this, uh, this shows here the exact um, points that were used for the analysis. And this was also published 
as a uh, in a journal um, as a comparison of the two different technologies, Lebanon and then uh, Insta, to see how they performed through the time. Um, so that shows how we can separate movement from one project to another project. I call this here geotechnical um, zone of influence. Um, this is really, um, here's another two tunnels. This is really to look at the wider area influence. Um, in most tenders uh, that come up and then the request for monitoring tunneling projects specifically, um, the exact buffer area left and right of a tunnel is typically quite small compared to the actual area that we really see that has moved. This is a casing example, really. These three time series here, again, everything is stable before the tunnel comes through. Here is where they, the tunnel comes in from the north and then slowly moves down to the south and we start to see different areas of settlement. The most important point to note here is the actual bowl of red. It actually extends out a little bit further out here to, to the uh, east and northeast of the area. So it's not just the area that's affected. I am not a geotechnical engineer and therefore I can't really comment on the exact geotechnical me mechanisms that are behind this, but it would depend on um, the uh, soils, uh, if there's any dewatering. Um, and well, at, at those point, I think are the two principal ones. Um, however, what we can see from the surface, and we're only looking at the surface, perhaps that was a, a point I should have made clearer at the beginning, but we're only looking at the reflection from the surface. So as the tunnel comes through underground, we're looking at the impact on the surface of underground activities. Um, we can, and we don't typically, but we can create these heat maps. The reason why we don't, and here I represent just the company I'm, I'm, I'm working for, but we don't typically create heat maps for a very good uh, and solid technical reason. We find a measurement point and we assign the measurement point. It doesn't matter how big the pixel is, how big the pixel is on your screen. It is representing the pixel of the satellite, which we know the dimensions of and we know where the satellite point is. If I don't have a measurement point for three or four pixels, for example, I lose the coherence. If I interpolate with a heat map, I am simply inventing information because I don't know what's happened there. I'm guessing, I'm interpolating, I'm smoothing, and I make a nice little heat map here. Um, but it's effectively inventing information. So the best map would be this one here with the discrete measurement points. I know for certain I have a measurement there and I can tell you how it's moved through time. Um, however, the heat maps are extremely useful to look at when it comes to determining um, wider area areas of influence. And you can see here well beyond several di diameters away from the uh, tunnel, I'm seeing already still contour maps here that draw areas of several millimeters of movement. And as we go through time one, this is a six month block, and then six months later, six months later again, I start to see how that area there, how the settlement changes through time. So it's acting as I expect, the tunnel comes through, we build the, the tunnel boring machine comes through, we build the tunnel, we create a settlement, over time it slows and compacts, and then we get very little movement in the last six months, makes sense. What happened here though, though it was that there was a claim from a building over here saying, I've got cracks in my basement, you've caused it, with your tunnel, we can see from the data and even from the original data set over here, there was no movement in these measurement points and therefore the, cl the claim was falsified. Um, reference points. Um, I haven't mentioned so far yet how our reference point system works with an inside data set. Basically, all of the dense network of measurement points, they're very um, interconnected, one each measurement point with several other measurement points, but there will be one reference point which is typically outside the area of interest that we are processing, and it is chosen automatically by the algorithm for its accuracy and its um, robust statistics in terms of coherence and then um, standard deviation levels of the return signal to the satellite. So it's chosen within the algorithm, um, and that is always zero. So it's always zero to which every other point moves. I come back to this example here of the Metro, the leveling survey that the, that the client did in situ looked a bit like this, but their reference point was placed here. And this is why none of their data made any sense. Their reference point was sinking pretty rapidly due to the existing um, uh, natural ground sediment that was existing in this area. Once they'd done the INSAR survey, they knew that they could put the reference point in an area that was stable. And then of course, all the leveling data made sense. Without this wider overview, of understanding about what moved where and when and what's stable, it was very difficult for them to, to, to say, okay, this is where we need to put our reference point. 
post-construction, reclaim land. Okay, here I talk about once you've finished a building um, or if you have reclaimed some land, for example, in, uh, in, in Singapore, we've recently done some analyses. This is actually Changi Airport. Again, this is a standard resolution satellite. Lots of ground changes here over this area. This is all reclaimed land in Changi Airport. What is interesting about this area here is that this is actually a, um, I'm not sure if they call it a seawall or a breakwater, all reclaimed into the sea. If you take an average of this area, we still see it settling. And this analysis was performed up until, I believe, uh, the early of last year. So total cumulative settlement for this particular area, and I've just taken an average here of this area, um, was around 160. We can see we've got um, very um, uh, accurate data down to 159.2 millimeters of total sediment for that area. Conversely, in areas where they've been reclaimed, and this island here was reclaimed, I think it was in the region of 20 years ago, we're still seeing very slow settlements, but yet we're, look, we're seeing very, very low levels of uh, displacement. So it's a confirmation that um, we're seeing um, the the, the correct range of displacements from areas where we expect to see very slow displacements because the ground has been settled and basically compacted and consolidated um, compared to areas that have just been recently or at least um, near recently uh, completed and are still settling. Um, on that previous slide here, um, it's not up to us to say if this is accurate or not, should, is this within limits or not. However, this data will help you understand is my asset performing as expected and within limits about what we expect to see. Dams and slopes. So I'm showing here a wide range of applications. Um, and I mentioned here dams. I mean, there are a number of dams in, in, in Malaysia. Whether there's your focus or not um, is not really the key aspect. I'm trying to show just a wide range of applications so that you can see how it's applied um, for different applications. Again, this is a standard resolution satellite. On the next slide, I'll show you a high resolution and you'll see the difference in density of points. For this particular dam here, um, we have a vegetated slope. So, okay, no points in that area. The client was just interested in understanding the settlement of the crest. Um, and we can see two areas here. They're actually performing differently. So we've got a crest that is settling um, with differential displacements um, through that period of time. This is four years. And over the four years, the area in the center has settled 97 millimeters, so 9.7 centimeters, and 4.6 centimeters here across to the uh, western flank. Conversely, look at the next area. This is um, a relatively new, newly built um, dam in China. Um, and we this is a high resolution sol solution. So we have a very high density of measurement points. Millions of measurement points were detected over this very uh, area here. Again, we get some consolidation across the dam face here. Um, very little compared to the two slopes. There's actually a fault uh, running through the fault, running through the area here. This is a 1D data set. So if we remember from my previous slides 1d in this particular case here the satellite was descending there's a very strong uh, easterly component in this flank here which is tied in well with the understanding of the slope which folds down towards the the, the, the dam face and that area is actually strike slip uh, moving down towards the south and towards the uh, e uh, east which makes sense and this area here is moving away from the satellite and it's moving actually into the lake reservoir natural uh, uh, man-made reservoir what we do see with with dams when you dam a certain area what happens is as you take the water away for hydroelectric power the water level goes up and down water level goes up and down which means the reservoir fills and depletes fills and depletes what does that do that creates different levels of pressure on the slopes and in some cases can cause instabilities to either become uh, less stable or to either completely fail. We have had that case in um, a few reservoirs. There was a very unfortunate case in Italy a few decades back where the constant change in water level caused a large landslide from the slope, which is like in this case here. Here we have a reservoir, here we have the dam. Here we see the slope moving. This is a very well understood and deep seated um, landslide. This got slow creep and yet hasn't failed. But in this particular example where the failure did happen, the slope came down, uh, extra volume inside the reservoir. The reservoir um, then pushed the water over the dam and then into the village below and um, several um, hundred lives were lost. So it is important to understand in these areas 
uh, where we have unstable slopes that we know that they're well covered. One of the only technologies that can do it is INSAR. There are different satellites that we could use for more vegetated slopes because typically speaking in the sloped areas where we do have dams, um, we do have trees and vegetation. So we need to use a specific satellite, accepting a slightly lower accuracy of displacement rate, but I'm going to help you identify where the instabilities are such that when we need when we need to know faster um, uh, data points uh, or we need to have in situ or real time accuracy, um, sorry, instrumentation in those areas, I can then deploy a local team to put in situ instruments. You'll see here green is stable, red is moving as has always been the nomenclature of our data. Um, we see a very clear delimination here of the area that's in movement and the area that's not. What we're critically looking for in these areas here is not necessarily a deep-seated, slow-moving landslide. Is it creeping at two millimeters per year? We know that normally already. Um, our data sets have been used to update landslide inventories across the entire, across entire countries indeed, for example, Italy, and the goal here is also to use it in Malaysia. Um, but what we want to really identify are areas that start to accelerate. And in, in vegetated slope areas, um, it's very uh, expensive to put ground instrumentation along every single 10 meters of uh, slope. So here's another example. Just to, sh just to clarify here, um, as I come into these last few examples, the differences between um, an as ascending and a descending satellite. In a mountainous area, consider the topography. Topography um, does have a big impact. If I'm looking at a satellite from a satellite down to the ground, of course, I can't see behind, behind corners. I can't see um, be up over slope benches. So we do have to be smart as well in the, in the looking angle of the satellite. Um, sometimes we don't have a choice and we have to accept where the satellite points fall. Um, with the ascending satellite here, we see this slope illuminated very nicely. This slope here, although it's illuminated, there can be other effects, um, which mean that this slope here is not best uh, monitored with the ascending satellite, and then likewise with the descending. Between the two satellites, I can see pretty well both flanks, and I can then identify which areas are accelerating. And in this particular case, I'm not really worried about using a 1D data set, because again, what I want to see is acceleration. I'm not really interested in accurate um, absolute displacement measurement. I want to know, is it accelerating or not? If it's accelerating, that poses a risk. Um, last tunneling example here, I believe, is where there was a landslide and a tunnel was created underneath the, the inactive landslide, but it was reactivated as the tunnel um, passed through. So in this case, we did provide a vertical and east-west, so 2D data, ascending, descending, put them together, vertical and east-west data. Very clearly see uh, the area that was affected. In the end, this entire village was evacuated, uh, which is very sh it's a great shame because it's a beautiful village on a hill in Tuscany in Italy. But you can see very clearly measurement point one, two, and three, the early onset of, um, sorry, the, the, the onset point of when the the slope started to fail, which is at the same time as when the, sub, the, the, the tunnel boring machine passed on through. First measurement point one, then measurement point two, and then measurement point three, and then we start to see this curve. That's the critical acceleration that I'm looking to tell you about with an INSAR analysis. It's an early warning system. And we have here, as it actually happens, we have here, um, this is a, each line here is a year. So this is several years of data, and I'm showing you in the last year this acceleration. That's why I'm saying that sometimes when it comes down to everyday imagery, it's not required because this here shows that over a year I start to see the acceleration. So even if I was delivering this data set once every month or once every two months, you would still have plenty of months to identify the acceleration um, for that period. <clears throat> and this is simply showing um, the density of measurement points compared to the four or five total stations that they had one, two three, four, five um, points compared to the density of measurement points that we found with the INSAR data set. <coughs> Excuse me again. Um, coming to the last few slides, and I'm aware that I'm, I've been an hour and a half talking now, and that should leave us with a good 25 minutes to discuss. I just want to highlight the fact that satellites are passing all the time. We now have coverage over the entire globe um, back several years. 
but we can look at the single building or we can go to an entire continent. And I'll just show you what I mean by that. We use the highest possible resolution where we really need to focus on a particular um, building. In this case here, this was used for a court case. There was a tunnel built underneath or some underground construction built underneath this Millennium Tower in San Francisco. The building started to tilt and they wanted to know by how much it had tilted and when it started to tilt. So we went back in time, processed the data and we showed this and this was then used in court. The goal here though is to demonstrate the density of measurement points that we can find on one single building. So from a single building up to areas. So here we're looking at villages and towns. We've got uh, a standard resolution analysis here. So not a very high density of measurement points. The, this analysis was actually done, as you'll see in the next slide, this is a zoom from the next slide over an entire city, like the Kuala Lumpur one that I showed you earlier. Um, but I just picked out here a few points here in the middle of uh, what appears to be an industrial estate, which has a quite a fast um, but consistent um, velocity uh, in amongst an area where there's very um, clear um, in, uh, sorry, stability. So I'm not sure the exact phenomena for which this is um, moving, but we can see this area um, subsiding and it's very clear on a carpet of basically green points. We see this clump here of areas that are moving. So single building area to kind of regional area. This is the same analysis. And in fact, those red points, I believe, came from this area down here. This is actually the city of Semarang. On the northern coast of Java in Indonesia, the reason why we process this is that there's a road running through this area. This is um, industrial water extraction combined with natural ground subsidence. So we see this really quite strong subsidence and a very clear delimination about where that area is subsiding and where it's stable. The problem is that there's a lot of differential displacement in this area. So I would expect to see cracks in buildings. Uh, damage perhaps to bridges and assets like a road, for example, draw a cross section across this area from the area that's moving faster back to so from left here is the green across to right in the northwest in the northeast. We see a very strong displacement here down to uh, 350 and I'd expect in this area here, which is exactly the area where the road crosses or indeed just up here, I would expect to see some level um, of uh, crack or at least damage to, to, to some level. Country scale um, is the same analysis that I showed you over Singapore. Um, it's very possible now, uh, depending on the inside provider, of course, to process entire countries on a regular basis. Um, so this here is the whole of Singapore. Admittedly, Singapore is a relatively small country and very compact, and it fits into one standard resolution track, two high resolution tracks, um, and then, of course, multiple very, very high resolution tracks. But again, we get what, when we do an entire country's analysis, what we get is from east to west and north to south, a complete overview of what's moved or what hasn't moved on the site. And then through, if your inside provider has the platform with the tools, you can then zoom in and then look at each individual area and do an analysis on each specific area. This is analysis we provided on the entire network rail, so the railway network in the United Kingdom. <laughs> this was done to highlight specific areas where network rail could go and say, I need to prioritize my budget for repairs or remedial work or preemptive uh, remedial work before damage happens or before there's a landslide onto my track or before um, something even worse happens where uh, we haven't seen anything and there's been a slow creep and then all of a sudden the track fails and then we might end up with a derailment. So they said, we want to see what the entire track is like. Please give us the entire country, which is exactly what we gave here. And we basically um, boxed the data into these discrete um, areas of minus four to plus four, minus uh, eight to minus four, or plus four to plus eight, and then vice versa, bigger than eight. Um, and that allowed them to say, okay, now I know what the velocities are like with their local uh, knowledge or a geotechnical interpretation company, which is not normally us, but we do work with some of them. We can take that data from a velocity map and transfer it into a risk map. And then the client has a tangible map to say, right, now I can do some, I should focus my areas here. Of course, it's not as simple as that in real life. Um, we have to take into account multiple different factors of which the inside data is just one element. Um, and uh, this here is a uh, continent scale, European ground motion uh, service. You can access this data for free. Um, 
And this data here has been processed using the standard resolution data over all of Europe. When you zoom in, you get millions more points, but of course, every time you, you scale out, it just for, for the for connectivity bandwidth reasons, they cut the data down a little bit. You'll see some very strong areas of movement. Norway's apparently, um, Norway and Sweden are apparently um, moving up. Um, so there are different data sets on there, and this is a perfectly open data source, so you can type in European Ground Motion Service on your uh, internet, and then you can access this data set by clicking the um, data set. Last two slides, and then I'd very happily open up to some questions. What would um, a an Insar company typically offer? Well, I've, I've, I've already actually mentioned these, but I'll go through it on these two slides just to show you. Um, how it's broken down. Actually, for most Insar companies, it's really the same kind of analysis. Um, it's just uh, the time period in which we process that. So satellite's been acquiring for many years in the past. If this is today, and you say to me, I'd like to understand what's historically happened over this area where I'm going to build a uh, overground um, light railway station, um, I can go back in time, take the data that's relevant as back as many years as you need, whether it's high resolution, standard resolution, I process it and I give you the data set and I give you the time series and, the, and you can access the data set and then interpret what's moved and what hasn't moved. Moving forward, I will task the satellite that I want to acquire at the frequency that I can over your specific area. Now, um, of course, depending on the satellite insert provider, um, you might get different options, but I mean, as long as you um, are getting the accuracies that you require, um, then there are really um, only a few options available if you really define the project well. So, like I said, the satellite will define this, the project will define the satellite that we use, and you can then get updates as often as you require up to the satellite acquisition frequency. So, this will be every few days at maximum. <coughs> And then normally, typically, projects are broken down into a year. So if you're getting updates every image, then you might get 30 or 33 updates per year. Um, and then uh, if you just need updates every month, then that's also acceptable. It very much depends on the project in hand. So that was my last uh, slide. Um, I hope everything was clear and that I've managed to give a, a, a decent enough understanding of how Insight works and how it can be applied. Um, uh, Mr. Treat, I'd be very happy to answer any questions, <coughs> excuse me, as and when they come up. And I sincerely apologize for my coughing. I've been on a plane more than I've been um, on the ground uh, for most of January and the early February. So I've picked up a few um, a few coughs from my, uh, from my colleagues in Italy over the last few days. So again, thank you for your attention and I welcome any questions. Yeah, hi. Uh, thanks, uh, Mr. Alasta, for such a great presentation. I think in, uh, in a way we have some better insight of uh, what is INSA all about and how does this application can assist in terms of the engineering as an engineering solution, especially in, the, in terms of geotechnical where it's settlement and also so instability uh, monitoring is a, is a big thing. Yeah. So uh, I have a couple of questions here I uh, would like to share uh, with the audience as well as uh, to, to get an answer from you, Mr. Alasta. All right. So uh, let me start with um, first question here. Uh, can you recommend where can I download the high and very high resolution images? What software do you deploy to analyze the displacement from INSA? Which type of satellite image do you use in your displacement analysis? Right, so uh, normally high resolution data comes from a commercial satellite operator. If you want to get hold of high resolution commercial satellite data, then you normally have, have an agreement with those satellite operators, okay? Um, and you'd normally get that data through uh, uh, an established INSAR company. If, to answer your second question, if you know already how to process INSAR data, and there are different types of, let's say, um, free or nearly free INSAR Soft, software packages, but they will not give you anything like the accuracy or functionalities of a commercial processing chain. If you have the capacity to process the SAR the data yourself with the software package, um, then you would need to obviously contact the satellite operator and then buy the imagery. That would normally come at a significantly higher cost per image than it would do through an Insar company. Um, we, well, I mean, if you it, yeah, for the company that I represent, which is on your screen, then we have our own commercial processing chain, as all commercial INSAR companies will have. They will not sell you 
the uh, software processing chain because it's their intellectual property. Okay, so we have our own. Uh, ours is called Squeezer, and other inside companies will have other inside processing chains. And um, I will freely admit um, that from a client's perspective, the INSAR processing chain that each company claims to have will, um, and at least for the near future, will continue to be a bit of a black box because um, we don't sell the data, we don't sell the software, we don't show you exactly how it works. Um, the only way you can really validate that is by looking at the accuracy of the data that is provided. And I think through research online, you can find out who the most pertinent insight players are and which ones have been integrated with in situ instruments and then with confirmation and accuracy levels. And of course, there are independent consultants who will take in, in situ data and compare it with insight data. Um, and then you will get your answer in terms of which are the most pertinent, uh, let's say, processing chains to use. But commercial insight companies will not sell the data. And Mr. Tui, there was a third question there, but I don't know if I answered it or not. Yeah, uh, which type of satellite image that you use in your displacement analysis? Well, they're called um, synthetic aperture radar images. So they're radar images acquired from the satellite operator. I mean, it's, it's a standard um, product that we that we buy from the operator, and then we process that with our, um, our algorithms to get the maps. So any commercial insight company will only sell you the final product, which is the color map, which shows you what's moved. Are on the ground. So really they're a service slash product company. Um, it's, it's a product in the sense that they deliver a data set, but it's a service in the sense that they also can, can give you the platform and then uh, regular updates. So it's not a clear service or product. Um, it's more a mixture of the two. Yep, there's a next question. Uh, can inside images estimate lateral movement in X and Y direction? Um, yes, so I, ans I answered that, but perhaps not with the same words. Um, so X would be your east, east and west, right? And Y would be your north and south. So uh, really what we're giving you is change in Z, right? We're giving you change in height. So, but we're actually showing the change in height from zero. So when we first give you the measurement point, if I go back here and if I uh, find a time series, um, just to highlight this point. So um, it, if you can see on my screen here still, um, every INSAR time series starts at zero. And the zero here is zero movement from um, the original X, Y, and Z position. I, You can see my screen, right, where it says single building monitoring. Yeah. Yeah. So what I'm then giving you is movement along either the line of sight or the true vertical Z, I'm giving you that movement through time. And I'm giving you that in millimeters of movement from the, the original point. I'm not changing X, Y, and Z of the measurement point location. I'm giving you X, Y, and Z, and that's for each individual point, you'll get X, Y, and Z, like latitude, longitude, and height in the data across the top here. I'm gonna give you the difference in, in movement of that point. So um, that will be in millimeters per year. Okay, so, so in, that, in terms that, of, mm, go on, sorry. So in conclusion, uh, I mean that with that movement that you are you are picking up, you can actually provide a, a, an estimation of the lateral movement, right? Yes, uh, but when we say lateral movement, again, I, I tried to make that quite clear when it came to the line of sight concept. Lateral, when you say yeah. lateral movement, <clears throat> I'm either measuring along, I'm either measuring along, this one's better, line of sight along the ascending so i'm giving you movement along line of sight which is this one here the green one or yeah. i'm giving you line of sight along the descending which is this one or i'm giving you horizontal and vertical right so mm. yeah, theoretically it's movement along east and west or it's movement along uh vertical it's never movement along um uh north and south mm. ah. so if, if there's a case where the slope or even uh, the measurement of the movement required on the north and south direction, then INSA not, will not be able to provide that lateral movement. Correct. Correct. If you class that as lateral, yes. I would class that as north-south, but yes, okay, okay. If you've got different terminology to what we normally use, then yes. Uh, north and south, we're blind. East and west, we can see. So we call that horizontal lateral. Uh, and then vertical, okay, we can see, along with the two different satellite line of sights. And like I said, the one point here, um, that we're trying to make is that if there is no 
um, east or west displacement, which may well be the case, and it can be an assumption, then we can simply project the line of sight to the vertical, or we just look at the accelerations in the line of sight, and they're perfectly acceptable in terms of another data set. Um, and nine times out of ten, you'll see that the, uh, the, the, the inside data agrees very nicely with, let's say, leveling data over the same area. Um, it's the trend we're looking at. And I think perhaps a, a, a question that I don't expect an answer to would be, when you look at displacements, yes, sure, for civil engineering projects, you need to know sometimes exact amounts of vertical movement to see if it's within limits about what was predicted, yes. But in terms of capturing unexpected risk, does it really matter how many millimeters of movement you've got, or would you like to just see the, capture the acceleration early? Which is another point that Insar can can offer. So I hope that answers the uh, your listeners' question. Yeah, right. So uh, I have the next question. Uh, how did you determine the angle of sunlight? How does this affect the input in the displacement analysis? That's a good question. Actually, we we don't necessarily determine the satellite angle. We can when we choose a satellite that's going for forward monitoring. For historical, of course. We're very much dependent on what's been acquired in the past. Um, so we don't normally choose the angle, the looking angle, and anyway, it doesn't normally affect the accuracy of the results. Only when, uh, if we need to be more sensitive to vertical, then we'll choose an angle that can be almost vertical. Right? I mean, within 20, 21 degrees, for example. If we need to be more sensitive to lateral movements, we can choose a move, uh, an angle that's uh, a higher angle, say 45 degrees. Um, but for historical data sets, we're 100% dependent on what data sets have been acquired in the past. And where you have both ascending and descending, we can anyway calculate the true vertical vector and the east and west displacement vector. So that's not an issue. And again, it very much comes down to what displacements you need. If you don't need 2D and 1D is perfectly acceptable, then um, from an economic point of view, it makes sense to just process the most pertinent ascending or descending data set. Okay, I hope this answered the question uh, from the audience. So next question, okay. uh, can we get slope movement from inside in jungle where no artificial static object exists? Yes and no. Um, this depends on the satellite we use. The most pertinent satellite would be what we call an L-band satellite. So there are three different frequencies, as I showed you, of satellite here. X-band, C-band, and L-band. I didn't go into too many details because of the, in, in, in terms of the, um, in terms of uh, 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 time efficiency on this. X-band has a short three, three centimeter wavelength, which is basically gonna always be attenuated and therefore no measurement points in forest. C-band likewise, 5.6 is really quite short for, for a vegetated areas. Whereas the L-band satellite, and there is also one in the middle called S-band, which is around, I think it's 16, which is about to come out. Those satellites have longer wavelengths. Um, and certainly for the L-band, that's the satellite that we would use for a vegetated area, simply because it's got a wide, it's got a longer wavelength, so it can penetrate better through the vegetation. And on top of that, it's got a wider pixel area, so it sends more energy down per pixel, per area. And so there's more reflection that comes back, and therefore there's more chance of us finding a measurement point. The downside is that the movement is normally around centimeter, not millimeter accuracy per year. And the pixel sizes can be really quite big. So your ability to monitor a small area in movement is significantly reduced. It is a trade-off between the different technologies and the satellite data that's available. Um, you can go for what we call high-resolution L-band data, uh, which tends to be relatively costly. So that's a small pixel size, but yet still with the L-band frequency, which means that you can get a very nice density of measurement points. And we've done that on multiple projects. Um, it just ha happens to be uh, a little bit more expensive than your standard, uh, let's say, X-band or standard uh, resolution satellites. But needless to say, like I said, the application normally decides the satellite data that we need to use. And so therefore, the choice is pretty much out of your hands when it comes to that. Only where there's a choice can we really choose the most economic option. Um, needless to say, yes, we can. Yes, we can. Uh, L-band uh, will never find the same density of points as an X-band satellite, but it's the best option we have at the moment for vegetated areas. Okay. So I uh, was just wondering, uh, one of the participants asked, how long it takes for one complete slope displacement analysis for, say, an uh, area of 100 by 100 meters? Well, uh, 100 by 100 meters for an inside company is an extremely small area. 
okay it can be processed let's just say for, for us it's not really the size of the area that makes a difference unless you ask me to process asia if you ask me to process even one satellite pick um let's say one satellite tile we're talking here about um several hundreds or tens of thousands of square kilometers so there's still a large area but still um as a kind of a baseline analysis and this will depend from company to company of course and i can only speak about the company that i represent normally a baseline historical study will take just a few so three to four weeks for a baseline study and then per update it can only take a few days so um once we've done the baseline we've got everything ready over the last six months for example if you say i want to see the historical um uh, movement on this slope where i've got a road running through it and and i go back three two or three years i take the data that's available i process it it'll take me a month to get the baseline ready and then if i want to go forward with regular monitoring um then i can i can add imagery as and when it's acquired and i can basically get the results out within a few days um, where there is really a rush to get data out, of course, any any company can um, prioritize a particular analysis. You need to be aware that most companies, uh, most inside companies, to stay uh, profitable, they need to um, keep the amount of jobs coming in uh, related to the amount of employees that they've got, and therefore they don't have uh, technical people sitting around doing nothing, waiting for a job to come in. They normally have a long string of commercial projects and therefore it gets inserted into the processing chain. That's why I say it normally takes three to four weeks for a baseline. I mean, project jobs, for example, um, uh, where there are massive earthquakes, of course, the data comes out within a day. So, you know, where there's an emergency, it can be done fast on a standard project, standard deliverable for a baseline, three to four weeks, which is not usually an issue because we're looking at the last four years of data. So, um, it's not a massive priority to have the data tomorrow and for the monitoring updates they, they try to come out as fast as possible normally within a few days of the satellite actually acquiring over the area I hope that answers the question yeah okay yeah. so next question we have, question uh, we have is that, uh, is, that is the soy pack affecting the measurement of INSA say or that again sorry soy pack, yeah does the soy pack affect uh the measurement of insa sorry types not 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 usually not usually um i can think of uh one project only where uh we had significant uh noise because of the ground conditions um normally we are we are not affected by that um and it still baffled the technical team for example as to what the exact issue was on the ground in the area most likely it was due to uh humidity in the water in the soil sorry and not the soil type itself we don't normally see a change in the um in the results or the accuracy of the results based on the soil type now okay So I think we have another question coming in. Uh, let's see. Uh, okay. If you want to localize an area for analysis, do you start from baseline data and only after that you analyze the localized area? Or baseline data means that uh, from, let's say, the city or country before you analyze the localized area. No. Uh, the word baseline here, I think we're using it for two different meanings. What I, what, what we mean by a baseline is you tell me your area and I focus on your area. And normally I'll process an area slightly bigger than the area, but only for accuracy reasons. Um, if your area is Kuala Lumpur, for example, or even a very small area, say, you know, three square kilometers. Again, that's quite a small area for us, and I understand that most projects can be a lot smaller. I'll focus on the area, and for us, baseline means time. So I'll take the data that's acquired in the last six months, for example, and I'll process that to get my baseline. That's my baseline starting point, my baseline data set. Then as the satellite acquires through time, I'll add on to the baseline, the monitoring imagery, and I'll give you an update. So it'd be baseline plus month one, baseline plus month two, baseline plus month three, right? So it's, a, it's an ever-growing time series. Um, of analyses and then uh, if you need to redo the baseline we simply shift the window and then we just take the baseline and then move it forward um, these are getting into kind of um, project specific questions which is fine and of course I'm more than happy to answer the questions but uh, just bear in mind that um, each project will most likely have a slightly different uh, approach and then a, a different outcome right great so uh, I think we have a block 
five more minutes before the end of our session. Probably you can take one or two more questions if there is any more. So uh, let us uh, please just type in the chat box, the message box, and then we will attend to your questions. If there's any more questions uh, to ask. Yep. So Mr. Alastar has been doing this for many years, I believe. So I, I believe uh, INSA is a technology which is uh, quite new to uh, the engineering industry. But uh, in other, other aspects, I believe that INSA has been adopted uh, in their application, right? So uh, uh, even in other countries, especially Europe and even the uh, Asia country like Hong Kong, INSA has been uh, quite... Uh, 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 quite a technology that they use often, right? Yeah, and that's a good comment actually. Um, for example, the Singapore project was done for the Land Transport Authority of Singapore. Uh, they wanted to have a, not the data I showed, because that was not confidential data that I showed, so, but they wanted to understand what's happened and moved over the island for the last 10 years. So they commissioned a historical baseline study and we did that, splitting it into different parts and then that data was then used to say, okay, we know what's happened in this area, there's a project there, let's go and look at it, let's assess the utility of this data set. Um, and as far as I understand, they uh, they found the data extremely useful and they are considering now how to move forward and implement that in the long-term monitoring strategy. Uh, but by far, Singapore was not the first country to do that on a country-wide scale. Uh, we alone, as the company that I represent, Thierry Altamira, we have processed all of Japan, all of France, all of England, all of Italy, uh, all of Belgium, all of uh, the continent of Europe. I mean, these are, um, and now of course, all of Singapore. Um, so these, what we call wide area products uh, are now becoming uh, something that is a standard uh, for the industry. Of course, each country has its own uh, requirements when it comes to um, what they would like to use INSAR for. Maybe it's updating the landslide inventory. Maybe it's looking at historical ground sediment. Of course, of course every country faces different geotechnical challenges. Uh, Indonesia is full of uh, slopes and volcanoes and unstable ground, or um, Malaysia has perhaps fault lines that run through, and you've got vegetated slopes as well with lots of uh, active infrastructure projects. Um, and, and these will be completely different to what we see in Africa and South American projects and European uh, countries. So really, the I hope I've managed to pass the message that as in as an inside company, we're processing radar data to give you a map about what's moved on the ground, but it has a wide variety of applications depending on the um, on the project in hand. So I hope I've managed to pass that that message. Yeah, so I think uh, there's no more question coming in. So but then I believe uh, did you have do did you post your email address here uh, somewhere in your slides? So probably if for those who are interested to understand more, uh, you can always reach out to uh, Mr. Alasta from the email on the slide below here. Yeah, if you, uh, I think many are asking for slides, your slides. I think uh, probably if you if you are able to uh, share your slides, probably taking up some of the sensitive information. Yeah, we will try to uh, distribute to the audience. Right? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, so uh, thanks again, Mr. Alasta, for uh, willing to spend your time and uh, deliver such an interesting uh, talk on uh, INSA. Yeah, so many thanks to you. I represent IEM Geotechnical. Uh, with, uh, of course, we are looking forward, if you in the future, that you can come again and deliver us another talk, probably uh, in another aspect of satellite usage. Yeah. Sure. So, uh, for all the audience, uh, thanks for joining our talk here. Just, uh, just a, a info, an information to everyone that we are that GEDT Geotechnical uh, Technical uh, Division will be having an uh, uh, interesting two days workshop on Euro Code Seven application in Foundation Engineering on um, 29th, uh, sorry, 29th February and 1st of March, two days. Yeah, by by our. We are getting a speaker from uh, NUS to, and also two more local speakers will be presenting in, in the workshop. So we hope that uh, it will be an interesting topic and those who are interested, please sign up. Yeah, and we are looking forward to see you on that day. Right. Thank you, Mr. Alasta, for your time. Okay, everyone, have a good day. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Have a good afternoon. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.